And now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for the evening. David McLennan has served as President and Chief Executive Officer of Cargill since, 2000, since December of 2013. He was elected to the Cargill Board of Directors in 2008 and was the company's Chief Financial Officer from 2008 to 2011 and as Chief Operating Officer from 2011 to 2013. Cargill, which celebrates its 150th year of operation in 2015, is the world's 31st largest company in terms of revenues and one of the world's largest privately held companies. Since being appointed CEO, Dave has advocated for the company to move faster, build trust through greater transparency, and focus on sustainability. Dave has been with Cargill since 1991 and has held management positions in its financial, risk management, energy, and animal protein businesses, living in both London and Geneva, Switzerland. Prior to joining Cargill, he worked in the futures and securities trading sector here in Chicago and for U.S. Bancorp, Piper Jaffray in Minneapolis. Outside of Cargill, Dave serves on the board of C.H. Robinson Worldwide and the Greater Minneapolis-St. Paul Regional Economic Development Partnership. He holds a bachelor's degree in English from Amherst College and an MBA in finance from the University of Chicago. Dave has other ties to Chicago as well, having lived here for a combined 16 years as a child and adult working at the Chicago Board of Trade and Board of Options Exchange. His wife, Kathleen, who is in the audience tonight, received her law degree from Loyola, and they continue to maintain close ties to the Chicago community. In fact, Dave, I understand you had to rent a tux the first time you came to the Economic Club meeting many years ago? Same, <laughs> s same tux or different rented tux? Bigger. Bigger. Please join me in welcoming Dave McLennan. John, thanks. Good evening, everybody. It is an amazing experience or opportunity for me to be here tonight. I used to come to the dinners of the Economic Club of Chicago thanks to, and I think he's here tonight, uh, a gentleman named John Ruth, who was a member of the Economic Club of Chicago, and he used to buy a table and invite young guys to come to, young people, to come to the, the dinner. And I can still remember, is at the Palmer House most times, and I remember seeing uh, Barry Sullivan, who was the chairman of First National Bank of Chicago at the time, uh, Jim Baker, who was Secretary of the Treasury. So for me to be here in front of this group, it brings on a whole host of, of, of emotions and thoughts and memories. I will admit to about of imposter syndrome. Hard to believe I'm here, and boy, I, I, in my mind, I'm still 25 and sitting out in the audience where you are. Um, but I have, do have strong Chicago roots. As John said, we lived here. My wife, Kathleen, and I spent a lot of time here, and a couple fun facts about my Chicago ties. My kindergarten teacher was Miss Daly, as in the Mayor Daly's daughter. Not, so this would be Richard's um, sister. I saw each one of my first professional games here. And in fact, my first professional football game that I saw was at Wrigley Field. It was the Bears against the Lions. So those of you who are there about my age or older, you'll remember the Bears played in Wrigley Field. But even more telling was that my, I was eight years old. And my dad dropped me and my friend off, off at the seats, and he went to better seats, so he left us alone for the game. <laughs> so in an age today when you couldn't do that, you certainly could leave a couple of eight-year-olds at the game and not worry about it. But it, it certainly says a lot about how the world has changed, and whether it was from the 1960s. But my wife, Kathleen, is also here. She used to be a, a um, I say that you were mean back in those days. She was a Cook County lawyer. And uh, she has softened her edges, but she also spent uh, a lot of time here with me when we first got married. And so Chicago is home, and if you don't mind, we call Chicago our adopted hometown, and it's really great to be back. Oh, thank you. I didn't say that. I wasn't pandering to the audience, but uh, nonetheless, it's, it's heartfelt. So as I thought about this evening, and, and Donna, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor. And I thought, what do you tell an audience like this, people from business and law and, and NGOs and social work, how do you say something that's going to be interesting and inspiring? And what can I, what can I do to talk about something that would, you'll take home with you? I also know that this evening is, is a time for young people to be here, uh, home from college, or people that have just started their careers. So I thought what I would do, and as you know, the title of my speech, Thriving in a Complex World, Thoughts on Business and Leadership. I've been in the job exactly one year and 17 days, and it's been an amazing year. And I thought I'd share some stories about what I've seen and some of the events that I've experienced as CEO, 
events that I'm sure anybody in these kind of positions could tell you nothing can really prepare you for. Uh, but it also, I'll, I'll draw out some themes about what does it mean about the food industry. And the ag and food industry is changing very, very quickly. Many industries are. But for something as basic as agricultural production and food production, the scrutiny that food production and, and ag is under these days is really quite significant and, and really quite extreme. I would also say as a company, what you just saw in two minutes from Cargill is, is um, when I first started in 1991, uh, somebody pulled me aside and said, let me give you some advice. If you ever get your name in the paper or your picture on TV, you're probably going to get fired. <laughs> and that wasn't that far from the truth. And being a family-owned company, so today we're owned about 90% by the Cargill and McMillan families and 10% owned by employees. But in a world where people want to know who makes my food, who are these big companies, we want people to know more about our story. But the fact is we're primarily business to business. We have some consumer brands. And being privately owned means there's not as much information available about us in the public domain. So it's a chance for me to tell our story and we're doing more and more of this. And in fact, I've said to my colleagues at Cargill that we need to develop a competency in telling our story and dealing with the press and things that those of you in the public sector do as a matter of routine and, and are very comfortable with. This is something new for our company. We're also about to celebrate our 150th anniversary next year. And it was really quite remarkable to think in American terms, 150 years is a very long time. In European terms, I went and visited someone at an Italian bank years ago, and I said, oh, we're 140 years old. And they're like, well, we're 390 years old. <laughs> I was like, sorry, I guess we're not that old. <laughs> but by American terms, we are. And uh, so it's, as we celebrate next year, our 150th, it's a chance for us to talk about what we've done. We're on our seventh generation of Cargill and McMillan owners. The fifth generation is active on the board. But if you read up on family companies, the average tenure of a family-owned company, two generations. So we've beaten the odds, it's gone well, and there'll be 150 more years to come, and I'm proud to be a part of this. So talking about the complexity of, of operating a food company and an ag company in a global environment, and some lessons about what's going on in leadership and what does it mean to be a company is, that's in a lot of connected um, and complicated places. The, the primary component of what we do and the supply chains that we're in, things like soybeans, cocoa, palm oil, corn, wheat, we buy from the farmer, they're our customer, we sell to customers like Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Mondelez, good Chicago companies. So we are involved from beginning to end, or as they say, farm to fork, in the food supply chain, which means we touch a lot of lives. It's a responsibility that is a significant one and one that we take very, very seriously. Today more than ever, and this is going to continue, people want to know, where did my food come from? Was it produced responsibly? Was it produced sustainably? Does it have genetically modified organisms in it? I want to see it on the label. And so it's not the old days of, I trust the brand, I trust the label, I'm good. Now it's, I know that brand, I know that label, but what are the ingredients that went into it, and who made it? How do they make it? If it's a meat product, how do they treat the animals? And so the scrutiny and transparency is, in, is, is far greater than it ever has been, and that's going to continue. And so that's part of what we're trying to do in terms of the food that we make is be more transparent and, and tell more about our story, our, our, tell our story. So about a year ago, I had just taken over as, as CEO, and literally first week on the job, I get a call from the head of our North American grain and oil seeds business who tells me that we have nine shiploads of corn steaming towards China, some of which have been unloaded at a Chinese port. And the Chinese government has decided that, or not decided, they've discovered the presence of a GMO, which has not been approved by the Chinese government, and that they're going to reject those nine cargoes of corn. Well, when the world knows you've got nine shiploads of corn on the water that is looking for a home, the price goes down really fast. So sure enough, we loaded back up the boats, put it back up in the market, and the industry, the corn exporters, companies like ours, um, Archer Daniels, others that are in, are in the business, suffered losses of about $3 billion collectively, of which our share was probably 100 to $130 million. 
So first week on the job, okay, one down, 51 to go. See how it goes. Well, the following month, those of you from the American Midwest, you know, along comes the polar vortex. Got really, really cold in the Midwest and also on the East Coast. Well, we depend on the transportation system, rivers, trucks, rail, to move stuff, to get it on trucks, trains, get it out of the field, get it out of storage, and get it to where it's going to be processed or to where it's going to be shipped overseas. It dramatically so slowed down the, the transportation system, which met, came at a significant cost. We also trade electricity. And our electricity traders decided that the cold wasn't going to go east and that the price of electricity was going to go down. The polar vortex did go east, and it got really cold, and the price of electricity went up. We had a short position, more losses. So two months down, I thought, OK. I cursed my predecessor under my breath. I wondered, boy, what more is going to come? And it certainly can't be like this every month. So a couple months go by, relatively quiet. And we find out in July that we, we have a facility. We didn't find out we had a facility. We have a facility in a, in a town in eastern Ukraine called Donetsk. Heard of, yeah, you've heard of it. <laughs> Bad time to have a plant in Donetsk. So a group of Ukrainian citizens who prefer Russia to Ukraine showed up and said, tell you what, um, we're going to protect your plant. We're going to help you protect your plant. And we need a fee for that. And we'll be back on Tuesday. Well, we've been around the block a few times. We know what a fee means. And this was a Thursday. So the first thing we did, the number one priority was keep our employees safe. So everybody go home, please. Locked up the facility, left. So when the loyalists to the Russian government came, they found a locked plant with nobody there. What they really wanted was to be able to climb on top of the sunflower seed silos. This is where we crush sunflowers to make sunflower oil for cooking so they could see the Ukrainian troops coming. It's one of the highest points in that part of Ukraine. That plant remains closed, and in fact, it was hit by four rockets during the war in August and will remain closed for a while. So more excitement, more unexpected events due to geopolitical conflict, in this case war, and uh, six months into the job, still pretty interesting. Hang, <laughs> still there, I thought it's got to get better. So sure enough, things did. and, and to be clear, the job I have is pretty amazing. And to be in 67 countries and the businesses that you saw every day is interesting. And I often get asked, what keeps you up at night? And for me, it's about what gets me out of bed in the morning. And our purpose to be the global leader in nourishing people, to me, is inspiring. And to put food on the table and to bring it around the world. In September, the UN Secretary General had a day dedicated to climate change. But 12% of greenhouse gases are created from deforestation, which is often related to the agriculture industry. Most notably, the Amazon, where a lot of land was cleared in the 1990s for production of soybeans. We're in, we buy soybeans from farmers. So we signed a pledge that said, we will do everything in our power in the supply chains that we're in to end deforestation by 2030 and to cut it in half by 2020. That got a lot of positive reaction, and that said to our customers, our employees, NGOs, indigenous peoples, this is a company that's committed to the environment and doing the right thing. Last week, I was in Indonesia and had the opportunity to meet their new president, who is a dynamic young leader who was a furniture maker, and he's trying to change the company, and we're in a, a big investor in Indonesia. This is the fourth pop most populated country in the world, 250 million people. They want to eat better. They want to live better. They want foreign investment. And so for us, we just opened a new co uh, cocoa and chocolate facility there. We're looking at building a chicken facility there. There's a statistic that when average household income gets to about $6,000, people change their diets. They shift from rice, grains, vegetables, and fruit, and they start eating meat. They want to eat protein. And so the world, our Car Cargill's world is shifting to the south, and to, meaning South America, Latin America, and to the east, Asia, Southeast Asia, and China in particular. So what are my, what's my point of these stories? Number one, the world's volatile and things happen very quickly. But in the world of food, governments want to know do you, what's the role of science in their food? Are there GMOs? There's unexpected events, but ultimately, being in the food business is typically a good thing. 
We're in Venezuela, for example, which is a very volatile place, but we make flour, we make pasta. So far, we've been able to operate, notwithstanding not being able to get money out of the country, but there's another hotspot of the world. It's a connected, fast-moving world. You have to be prepared, but the world of food and the world of agriculture is changing very, very quickly. It's also about transparency, and I think big companies are a force for good in the world. I think capitalism is a force for good in the world, and I think we have a role to play through food and through open trade. As I said a few minutes ago, people want to know what kind of food they're eating and where did it come from and who made it. I find that as I recruit and go to, um, I try and get to at least one business school a year, what are employees looking for? What do they want in a company? And so in the old days, when I came out of college in the early 1980s, a lot of people went to Wall Street. A lot of people wanted to make a lot of money really fast. Today, it's more about, are you a socially responsible company? Do you do the right thing? And it'll take less money to work at a place that has a noble purpose and that's doing good things in the world. This is where I think a younger generation is going relative to how they make their decisions uh, relative to choosing an employer. So we have to operate. It's compelling for us to do it, but it's the right thing to do. But to survive for the next 150 years, this is what it's going to require. Additionally, it, growing into emerging markets where economies are growing, people's dietary consum consumption patterns and habits are changing, means you're in more politically and, and uh, socially volatile places, places like Indonesia, Venezuela, Russia, Ukraine. You have to be prepared to take the risk. You can't shy away from it. You have to have a resilience and a commitment to your business and to the people in those economies and to making uh, food and nourishment for people that need it. So I think the 21st century, and uh, in terms of leadership, it requires new leadership qualities. It requires being able to deal with uncertainty and risk. It, re it puts new demands on leaders, the unexpected, the ability to try and anticipate events as they come, what's going to be the impact on we of weather, and the volatility and weather, pla uh, weather patterns, whether it be the polar vortex or the significant drought that occurred here in the American Midwest three years ago, means volatility in prices, means helping farmers manage their risk, but it means new skills in risk management and production that a world of the 1980s when I was here and in, in a world 30 years from now which will be very, very different and much more complicated than it is today. The heart of our leadership model and the leadership model that we teach to young people talks about courage, integrity, and conviction. And conviction means the conviction to say, I'm not going to bail out of a country. So we're still in Ukraine and we have three locations. We have about 1,500 locations around the world and three of them are still open in the Ukraine. And it would be very easy to say, i got to get out of here. It's a really dangerous place. What's going to happen in Russia? You can't do that. You've got to hang in there and not flee at the first sign of danger or the first sign of risk. Russia, we're the ninth biggest foreign investor in Russia today. We make chicken, we make malt, we make starch, we make animal feed. Very volatile place. But in terms of being a supplier of food to the world, and again, the breadbasket of Eastern Europe, Russia, and Ukraine in terms of growing sunflower seeds and wheat, you have to be there, and it requires a conviction to be there. So these are qualities that we value, and the resilience and conviction to hang in there and to manage the risk. So I'm going to start to wrap up and turn my comments to the younger people in the audience and just some thoughts about leadership and your career as you think about it, and, and maybe it's also true for some of you that have been in business for a while like I have. When I first came out of college, and I majored in English, I thought I was going to be a school teacher. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I came to the Board of Trade and I started out as a runner, running orders into the pits and answering the phones, and there wasn't technology then. And it's amazing to think, 1982, what that was like. But I remember going, when I went to University of Chicago Business School, and I was in a small group with some people, a couple of engineers and some math majors, and we went around and said, you know, uh, where did you go to college? What did you major in? And it came to me, and I said, I majored in English. And there was this painful silence, and the guy goes, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> so here I am and an, as an English major, and in fact, 10% of Fortune 500 CEOs have a liberal arts degree. So I believe in having a liberal arts approach to your career, but learning how to speak and write and express your thoughts. 
as great preparation for the kind of things and events that I've seen in just a year on the job. Secondly, careers are not, oh, thank you. Thank you. My son just graduated from a liberal arts college and he majored in uh, political science. And there were days we'd like, why am I doing this? So I reassure liberal arts grads, it's the right thing to do. Secondly, careers are not linear. I could not have imagined standing in front of you today, this tonight, as a 25-year-old at a table and watching dignitaries of that time. I was starstruck, and I just you don't know how things are going to work out. In the same way that in my first year on the job, I didn't expect the war in Ukraine, the embargo of our corn cargoes going to China, the cold weather that created trading losses and, and slowdown in the transportation system. You just don't know. But take risks. Don't be afraid. The world is filled with risk, and it's going to be more riskier as time goes on. But with risk comes reward, and with risk comes opportunity. Don't be afraid to embrace the challenges and the complexities of today's world. And that's for everybody. And I'm sure those of you who have been in business as long as I have well understand the complexities and risks, but the payoffs that come from being comfortable with taking risks. Quote from Benjamin Franklin, to succeed, jump as quickly as opportuni at opportunities as you do at conclusions. And I liked that, but I also think oftentimes of a book that I read, and it talked about taking risk. And it said, go ahead, try and avoid risk. It's everywhere you want to go, everywhere you might go. In fact, you can stay home and stay in bed if you want to, but risk is going to find you. Every year, in the United States, 100,000 people go to the hospital to be treated for injuries suffered from falling out of bed. <laughs> so it's there. Find it. Even in bed, whether it's Russia, the other places I've mentioned, enjoy it. Enjoy the ride, just as I have. And it's a privilege to not only to be the CEO of the company that I am, Cargill, of which I'm very proud, and our noble purpose. And, in terms of getting food to people as their incomes grow and being able to part of the food supply system. It's an honor, but most importantly, it's a real honor to be able to address you and to come back home to Chicago. Thank you. Thanks very much for your talk. You're welcome. Uh, maybe as we get started, just um, given the large food ingredients company that you are, if you think about the dinner we had tonight, yeah. how much of that passed through Cargill at some point in time? All of it, I hope. No. <laughs> You know, there's a little adage, and I, I can't prove it, but that in any given day, the likelihood is high that you've consumed a cargo ingredient. So we're in the cocoa business. I hope you enjoyed your chocolate dessert. I don't know if that was car <laughs> uh, cargo cocoa. Maybe it was ADMs. We're the number two beef producer in this country. We have a few branded names, Sterling Silver. Maybe that was cargo beef. I should have called ahead and made sure that it was. <laughs> sure. But we are, and again, being B to B. You, you don't know. There, there's, there is a branded product of which I'm very proud. It's called Truvia. It's made from stevia. That's a Cargill product. And it's zero calorie, a higher intensity sweetener. I think it's 150 times sweeter than sugar. And if you look on the bottle of vitamin water, you'll see the little Truvia label. So that's about as far out there as we get on brand, branded products. But I, I'm, I'm hoping that tonight had some Cargill ingredient in it Good. and that you enjoyed it. So uh, you touched on in your talk uh, food ingredient reputation management, yeah. the, looking at the, uh, not just the quality of the food, but the ethics of the companies that are behind that. Yeah. How has that impacted the way you do business at Cargill? I think part of it is it's, it's impacted the way in which we tell our story. As I referred to in my remarks, um, we have to be more uh, transparent about who we are, what we're doing. Uh, the, defore the New York Pledge on Deforestation, which we signed in September, I, I think it's, for me, it was, we need to be a leader in things like environmental responsibility, sustainability, deforestation. I don't want to just be doing it as a company because everybody else is. I don't want to be doing it because our customers are saying, you need to do this. I want to be doing it because it's the right thing to do, because it's good business, it's embedded in our strategy. And so for us, part of it is communication, but part of it is, working back in the different supply chains with the people that we're doing business. So we will not buy soybeans from Brazilian farmers that have committed illegal deforestation. So it means you've got to have more around. I agree. I agree. 
If you've flown over the Amazon before, it's, it's a devastating view um, of the, the swaths of land in the, in the uh, Amazon that, it, that were converted to uh, ag production. Nonetheless, it's a country that's committed to improving it and reversing the trend. But it means working back in the supply chain because, uh, as I mentioned, we're in the front end and the back end. So we feel that we're responsible for knowing where is our supply coming from. In the same way our customers want to know who's Cargill, what did you do, what kind of company are you, we've got to know farmer Jane, what did you do, how did she raise the soybeans, and were they raised in a responsible way? Uh, so your declaration to end deforestation is a good example. How do, you, how do you quantify the societal benefits of the investments that you make in sustainability? How do you think about that? You know, that's, that's a question that I've gotten frequently inside the company is how much is it going to cost and what's the payoff? Mm -hmm. and, and my belief is, and I can tell you unequivocally, uh, unequivocally um, that we have customers that will not buy from us, will not buy ingredients, whether you want to call that societal cost, but in terms of, you know, how do you monetize that? I guess I don't want to think of it in purely in P&L terms. I want to think of it in terms of it's the right thing to do. It's what's going to help the environment, the planet survive long term. But I know firsthand that we've got sets of customers that they insist that the ingredients they buy from us are certified. Um, we've done that. Here's, here's what I think is, I can't give you a, a dollar figure. We're in the cocoa and chocolate business. The top producing cocoa and chocolate, or cocoa countries in the world, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, Western Africa. We created something called the Cargill Cocoa Promise, which says we will go and help train farmers on how to raise cocoa responsibly, safely, not using child labor. So for example, have you ever seen a, a cocoa pod? It's about this big. And in the past, they would split it open with a machete. What we've asked them to do is split it open with a stick. Safer, less, less hazard. And if they do this and follow the requirements that we have for raising cocoa sustainably, we pay them a premium. So we'll pay them more than market price if they meet these certain standards. So I was in um, Cote d'Ivoire uh, about 18 months ago, go to a village where there's a co-op where we buy cocoa. And with that premium that we paid them for the cocoa beans, they've built a doctor's office, they built a school, and they've built a bank. So for me, there's your the mm -hmm. societal benefit is when you go up into the bush, as they say in Cote d'Ivoire, and see that they, they, their lives have been improved. Not only do they raise cocoa more sustainably, they've taken the premium that we've paid and reinvested it in their community. That says that's the right thing to do. Thank you. So just give an example. Give us a few others of how essentially food production differs around the world. I mean, yeah. how, so how different is it in China or South America versus food production here? And, and would we be shocked, dismayed yes. at the yes. different qualities or levels of food production? You would. And, and I think I just gave you an example about what is really a primitive um, and labor-intensive way to produce chocolate, to produce cocoa. I think a, a really good example is food production in China. So we've recently built a chicken processing facility in a, uh, Anhui province, which is about 200 miles northwest of Shanghai. And this, you, you can never guess this number. I like to you know, throw out little fun facts. But every week, that facility processes um, 1.2 million chickens a week. So do the math. That's about, what, 200,000 chickens a day? And my, my brain just thinks, okay, that's two Michigan stadiums full of chickens. <laughs> a day. So call it 60 million chickens a year. So for us, building that facility, in part for our, our customers, McDonald's, or KFC, or retailers like Walmart, is because the alternative, if you've ever been to China, is you go to a wet market. And a wet market is basically they take the live animals and you point out what you want and they kill it on the spot. And maybe they kill it before you get there and they hang it on a, on a string for you to come and pick out. Well, guess what? There's a lot of disease and a lot of stuff that you don't want to think about relative to what could happen. So modernize not only in terms of disease-free and not having things like growth hormones in your, in your, in your products, and, and that does exist in a lot of countries in the world, 
but bringing modernized, more modern and at scale food production like chicken processing in China is a dramatic change mm -hmm. in, that, in that country. So, it's also on food. I've read that we grow enough calories in the world yeah. so that no one would go hungry, yeah. uh, but obviously lots do. Yeah. Um, what is it that Cargill can or does do to address that? Well, it's, um, there's a couple, there's several things that could solve that. So when you talk about the food is there, so we've got a, a planet of 7 billion people supposedly going to 9 billion. Maybe if people are wrong, call it eight and a half. A lot more people will be here in 2050 than we're here today, are here today. And there's a couple of things that, that need to be done and that need to change in terms of helping the, 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 the food and the calories get to places where it's needed. And the irony, of course, as we know, in North America, we've got an obesity problem, and yet you go to India and you've got hundreds of millions of people who are malnourished. So number one is you've got to have open trade. You've got to have the ability to get food from places of surplus to places of deficit, to get it from places where it can really be grown effectively and to other countries or within a country. So you've got to be able to move it and trade it and keep borders open. We believe strongly in that. Secondly, um, Af Africa needs to develop their farming and their ag economy. So you talk a lot, we've talked, we think and talk a lot about food security. How does a continent like Africa feed itself? So a billion people, a billion, a population of a billion on the continent and probably say 40 to 50 percent of the world's arable land, and yet a very underdeveloped farm economy and ag economy. So we are looking actively, we probably have about 2 percent, forgetting about cocoa and chocolate, of our total investment in Africa. That's something we want to do. We want to help develop uh, an ag economy, be a facilitator for food security. Um, and then also the food versus fuel issue. So. Um, Things like how much corn is mandated to go into ethanol and having, having more relaxed standards or more flexibility. So for example, three years ago when there was a big drought in the U.S., you still had renewable fuel standards about how much corn had to go into ethanol. At the same time, you were running a, you were, we were running risk of shortages because there was a drought. So we were actually importing products from Brazil rather than saying, you know what, we're going to relax the ethanol standard so that it can go into food. So having a flexible policy or more flexibility around what of sugar or corn goes into fuel versus food, food uh, we think is very important. So those are the things that in terms of getting food for nourishment mm -hmm. and having balance around it, we think are necessary and important. Right. So you touched on there, obviously, that we have, uh, you know, although there's malnourishment elsewhere in the world, we have higher rates of obesity, yeah. um, increasing rates, childhood obesity, obesity more generally. Right. Uh, obviously, it's become more of an issue. Uh, do you have a role to play in the obesity issue? And if so, what is it? Well, I think we do in, the, in, in terms of our commitment and our relationship with our customers. And so, as I was talking about, people want to know what's in their food. They want to know, is it healthy? How do I reduce my caloric consumption? So something like Truvia, where you've got the taste and enjoyment, the sweetness of stevia, um, and yet zero calories for it. And so. For us, it's about innovation, and it's about m creating ingredients that are either trans fat free um, or low in calorie to help our customers. General Mills is a customer of ours. The world's changing. Consumers in this country are changing the way they buy food, and they want um, you know they want things that are healthier, lower calorie, but still have the taste and still cost the same. Mm -hmm. And so, for us, w in terms of obesity, our role is innovation through making products, making ingredients that in turn go into other products, which are healthier, lower calorie, and have, have, and, um, have good taste. Uh, in in uh, your opening remarks, you, t you told the story about China rejecting your shipment of genetically modified yeah, corn. It was good times. Um, where, <laughs> uh, where's China today on that? Are they going to, will they change their views? And if they do, is that huge impact for Cargill, modest impact for Cargill? It's a complicated question because a lot of it depends on the size of the Chinese corn crop as to how much corn they want to import. Um, and now this particular strain or this particular genetic trait which was in corn and the name of it, the commercial name is called Viptera, they have not approved. But now if you read stories in the press about this trait, supposedly they're going to approve it soon. 
But this year, we didn't export any corn to China. Mm -hmm. You know, pass the, pass the idiot test. You know, okay, learn my lesson once, not gonna do that again. <laughs> um, but the fact is, they've had a surplus, they put a bunch, they had a really good crop, mm -hmm. and they put a bunch into storage. They didn't need it. But as long as it's not approved, so what we had to do is go back, reverse through the supply chain here in the US, we've told our farmers, if you are growing corn with that particular trait, we're not gonna buy it. We're gonna put you on notice. Now, there's another um, commercialized trait coming from uh, through the same company, Syngenta, which hasn't been, hasn't been approved in China. So they may, if China approves Viptera, they may not approve the next one. And so what we've got to do is work backwards and hopefully with companies like Monsanto and Syngenta and say, we need to work together here. We want to have, the U.S. farmer wants to export their corn. I mean, you've got a domestic market, but you've got a huge country that's increasing its consumption of meat, that's increasing its consumption of grain and oil seeds. We want to develop a market there. It's good for this economy. But we can't do it if the government of China hasn't approved these traits, so please work with us. So we're not doing it alone, but you know, to go back to your question, John, it's about you know, not shipping it anymore, but also working with the seed companies to make sure that the approval gets, is, it, is, gotten, is received before um, the, the commercialization. Talking about Cargill, the company, just uh, how, how would you think about, how do you define the culture at Cargill? And you've got such a diverse workforce mm -hmm. all around the world. How, yeah. do you, how do you instill that culture or manage that culture yeah. and try and get it somewhat consistent around the globe? You know, it's a very collaborative culture. I mean, the challenge for us is we've got 63 different business units, you know, everything that you saw on the, on the video, you know, everything from a corn business, soybean, meat, we own a steel mill in Ohio. Um, and how do you knit together this diverse portfolio of businesses with common themes, like culture? So a commitment to guiding principles, a commitment to ethics. I used to think, you know, anybody can be committed to ethical business. That's not that much of a competitive advantage, but the longer I've been around, yeah, anybody can do it, but not every company does. And mm -hmm. so I think, I think people would describe Cargill as really committed to an ethical standard of behavior. Um, I think as, as we've grown and our growth has come in international, outside of the U.S., uh, being faster moving, the competition's different. So, you know, companies like Archer Daniels or Ingredion or Dreyfus or Bungie, great competitors, but we're also competing against regional players, you know, POFCO in China, for example. So we've got to be a lot faster and have the benefits of being a big, well-capitalized company, but acting like a small entrepreneurial and agile company. So part of what I've been trying to do in a year is change the culture, change the things that need to be changed, which is make decisions faster, get there before the competition, look out the window and see what your customers and your competitors are doing, but at the same time holding true to the core of the company, which has been for 149 years, a collaborative culture, an ethical culture, um, and one that's committed to agriculture and, and food production. And I mean, given, again, your global span, global reach, and the diversity of your customer base, how important is diversity to your success or to just the, the organization, and how do you view that? It's hugely important, and I will say that we, um, we have not succeeded in that regard yet. From a standpoint of gender diversity, so our top leadership team of five has exactly zero women on it, and I am committed to changing that over time. Our top leadership team of 25 has two women on it. If you keep on going, the numbers get bigger and better. Um, and you can also describe diversity of, you know, the person who runs our Chinese sweeteners and starch business in China is a local. So if you look ethnically, our philosophy about hiring is we typically will send expats in to get the business up and running, but we want it run by locals. I also believe that you, you have to define diversity in, uh, in ways other than that which you can observe. So we can see gender diversity, we can see ethnic diversity, um, but you can't see diversity of thought, you can't see diversity of experience. My little fun fact about being the ninth CEO in Cargill history, I'm the first Cargill CEO that has not worked at Cargill their whole career. So I started here in Chicago for a, a small privately owned firm. I left Cargill for a couple years, worked for a US bank, uh, U.S. Bank Piper Jaffray came back. But my predecessors had all started right out of college or grad school. I, I th actually, I think one of the CEOs worked for a, an NGO for a year. 
but our CFO, which we, who we just hired about a year and a half ago, was the CFO of Sara Lee, and he's Dutch. And so for us, hiring laterally is a change to the culture, but it means different experiences that you didn't work there your whole career. It means you saw other parts of the world. It means you think differently. It might be something as subtle as an introvert versus an extrovert. So I'm, we're working hard to define diversity as beyond that which is observable, but ultimately we need more gender and ethnic diversity in our senior ranks. And that means moving down, you know, attracting, retaining uh, people of color, uh, women, in positions where they will have a lot of different choices of diverse individuals to promote. So you touched on that you've been private for just about 150 years now. Yeah. What, what's the secret? How does your governance work? Um, do you get, I mean, you mentioned seven generations of family owners yeah. effectively. Uh, do you get pressure from family members who want to enjoy more liquidity? <laughs> what are you doing here? Um. <laughs> well, I've got a follow up question you'll see in a minute. <laughs> so I'm going I'm to talk <laughs> slow then. <laughs> um, I see no uh, change in the view that being privately owned is a really good thing. We can take our profits and we pay a percentage of our profits to the family as dividends, to the Cardio and McMillan family, and the rest gets reinvested. We have a really good deal. Basically, we're in control of our own destiny. We're profitable, we raise the capital, we increase the capital to be able to build a new plant in China, in Indonesia, or go out and buy a company, do an acquisition, or maybe let it sit in cash on the balance sheet. And, and so that's a real luxury, but it's also a luxury. I am completely um, in admiration and empathy and sympathy for you public company CEOs. And I don't know how you do it, you know, dealing with the analysts and quarterly earnings, and I couldn't imagine it. I worked at a public company for two years, but the fact is we've had some businesses that have struggled over a period of quarters, and I know that if we were a public company, we'd be getting huge pressure from institutional investors or from analysts or for the press, like, what are you doing? We've got, an asset, we've got a private equity fund with about $8 billion in assets. We've got a hedge fund with about $5 billion, 4 to $5 billion in assets. The analysts are saying, wait a minute, aren't you an ag and food company? How, how did that happen? So it, it gives us the, the, the ability to diversify and to the ability to be long-term. I think the secret is that the family is we have a great relationship with our family owners. And I heard one of them say, they asked a similar question, is what's the secret? And, and they said very candidly that they knew when to recognize that they didn't have the talent or the managerial experience in the family ownership structure to put into management. And I think there's a lot of family companies where they gotta have somebody with na their name on the door, even if they may not be qualified. And I, and I respect and compliment the McMillans and the Cargills for knowing when that was no longer the case. So the last family uh, shareholder CEO retired in 1996, and there's been four CEOs since then. But I, I think they, they love being private. They like reinvesting uh, their profits in the business. Our governance is split. So Art Collins, who's up here in the dais, is one of our independent directors. We have six independent directors, either current we're former CEOs. We have six family directors that represent the Cargill and McMillan families. But one of our independents once said, this is great because if I want to know what the shareholders want to do, I just look to my right and look to my left. <laughs> They're in the room. <laughs> and, and so at the, at the same time, there's the challenges of how do you continue to perpetuate family ownership. And we're now in a situation where there's only one Cargill and McMillan family member working in Cargill. So the current Cargill and McMillan family directors, they all work there. They know us. We know them. We have to inculcate successive generations of Cargills and McMillans to understand what do we do, why are we passionate about the company, and so that's one of the challenges in terms of ongoing governance and succession relative to the family owners. But I don't see us going public in, in my tenure. Okay, so the follow-up, are there circumstances I under which- I didn't talk slow enough, did I? No, <laughs> so are there circumstances under which you would advocate going public? And then if so, you're gonna hire William Blair to do it? <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> There's the hook. You know, we came, I wouldn't say we came close, but about five or six years ago, our largest shareholder uh, died. And she had no heirs, she had no kids, she never married, and she left her money to a charitable trust. 
and it was about 16 or 17 percent of the company. So the trustees showed up and said, um, oh, we'd like our money, please. We'd like to cash out. And we said, you know, we don't have whatever the number was, billions. We don't have it sitting around, sorry. And they said, well, we'd like you to go public now. And I'm condensing three years of conversations into <laughs> <laughs> in case you hadn't picked that up. Um, we, uh, and we said, well, we don't want to do that either. And so ultimately, we ended up, we owned a, a, a fertilizer company called Mosaic, which actually was the, the um, combination of our own fertilizer business with a formerly Chicago-based fertilizer business called IMC. And we were able to tr basically exchange our shares in the fertilizer company to give to the, uh, the Margaret Cargill Foundation for their shares in Cargill. So that was one circumstance, better lucky than good. We were lucky, but at the same time, we were prepared. One of the disadvantages, and it probably won't come as terribly insightful, but the fact is, for us, we have two means, for, two primary means for growth. One is reinvest the capital that we make, the money that we make, and two is the debt market. So we borrow publicly rated debt. We have a commercial paper program that we use to buy inventories at harvest in North America or South America. We really depend on the debt markets as our oxygen, as our capital. Unlike the benefits, I talked about the challenges of being a public company where go in the market, do an equity issue, boom, you got the capital. We can't do that. And so, you know, if it got to a point where either we had significant growth opportunities or if there was another, call it a governance or ownership issue like the one that I described, maybe. But again, my sense of working with the family, their commitment to being private and staying family owned has never been stronger. Uh, in your base business, you mentioned you've got 130 plus billion dollars of revenue. Historically, it's been a fairly low margin business. You've been it is. trying to change that and invest and grow in areas that are higher margin. Right. Um, I guess, why are you trying to change that now and what risks do you see attendant to that? I mean, a part of it is, I, I, you know, the diversification of the portfolio overall and, and you saw the businesses that are in there. You know, I, I would, I'd like to see us move further up the value chain in terms of innovation, in terms of value-added products that have higher margins. Um, you've got a lot of volatility in terms, you know, a, a, a good percentage, not a good, but a measurable percentage of our revenues, of our profits come from trading and, and, and risk management. And so sometimes when you get markets that don't move around a lot, you know, it leaves you at the mercy of, of lack of volatility, for example. So I, I, I would call it, I call diversification of the earnings stream. I would call it part of the mission of, you know, being more involved in the called the back end of the supply chain. Uh, you know, closer to ingredients that our customers are buying, things like Truvia that are higher margin. And I think the the risks of that are it's a different skill set. We're not a branded food company, and every once in a while somebody come in and say, you know, we should buy this branded food company. We don't have that skill set. We're B two B, and so. I don't see, I think, a radical redesign of getting into consumer brands. And effectively, by doing that, you start competing with your customers. Mm -hmm. So I, right now, I don't think it's a very good idea. So uh, in, in, in terms of growth and opportunities, where, where are you focusing your investments uh, in terms of either types of businesses or countries, or how do, you, how do you think about where your primary investment focus is today? Yeah, so the most recent investment, the reason I was in Indonesia last week, is we open up a new cocoa and chocolate facility in East Java, East Java. And it'll process about 70,000 tons of cocoa beans in a world market of four million tons. So do the math on that. So not a huge part of the supply. But the fact is, I mentioned that statistic about as incomes go up, people want to eat differently. They want to eat meat, they want to eat protein. As they keep on going up, they want to consume luxury goods, things like chocolate. And so chocolate consumption in places like China, for example, where incomes are rapping, uh, rising quickly, Indonesia is going to be a great market to serve China and Southeast Asia as consumer tastes move into fun stuff, you know, from the basics, rice, grain, fruit, meat, into things like chocolate or alcohol. So we, um, we make alcohol, uh, potable alcohol in Europe, for example, out of wheat. And, and so things like that, which is, again, more value added and which is serving changing consumer tastes in a growing population and growing income base. So it means places like Southeast Asia, we built a corn mill in, in, um, in Brazil to make starches, industrial starches as well as sweeteners. 
And so our, our biggest investments recently have come Indonesia, Brazil. We're building a corn mill in India, for example, our chocolate facility in Indonesia. So emerging markets, which means more volatility, which means more risk, but it also means more opportunity because diets are changing, populations are growing. So one, one final question, since you run one of the biggest and most important food companies in the world, tell us about your daily, your personal daily consumption and what kind of diet you have <laughs> and what food you typically eat and what we should learn from that. <laughs> well, I eat Cargill products every day. <laughs> you know, the good news about tuxedos is this cummerbund will hold in uh, my, your increase and you can, so you can't see um, that I consume plenty of Cargill products. <laughs> Um, but I try and you know, I, I try and eat my cargo, uh, a cargo product every day, but it, whether it's intentional or not. Um, but I, you know, I'm a believer in protein consumption, and I and we have Trevia at home, and so I'm proud of our products um, and proud of what we make. But I uh, I battle with my calorie intake versus my caloric uh, out uh, outtake, I guess, or output relative to exercise. Uh, I don't think I'm alone in that, but um, that is a constant struggle. But nonetheless, we're making healthier foods, we make good stuff, and I try and eat something every day. Good. David, thank you very much. Thanks, I appreciate John. you joining thank us you. here. And Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. That was fun. Appreciate it. Yeah, that was good. Thank you for doing this.